Hi, everybody. Um, we're here today to talk, to talk about the things that have happened in Gradle since the 1.0 release. So we'll talk a little bit about how we got to 1.0, some of the things that happened along the way, and focus mostly on some of the cool new features that you can use with the 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3, which was released today, if you didn't see. So my name is Luke Daly. I'm a Gradleware engineer. I work on the Gradle code base. I give training courses, consulting services, that kind of thing around Gradle and automation technology more broadly. So let's get started. So before we can talk about the, the cool new things that we've added since releasing 1.0, I'd just like to take a little bit of time to talk about the, the road to 1.0, so how we got to that point. So about 18 months ago, the 1.0 milestone process started, and that was really to signify to our user community that 1.0 was starting to stabilize and starting to land towards a final release. Now, relatively early in that process around milestone three, we made a decision that we needed to essentially swap out Ivy as the fundamental component or the fundamental uh, dependency management implementation in the system. Uh, that was it wasn't an easy decision to make. There was you know, it was it, it was a big decision that had lots of impact. So there was lots of serious discussion that went on. But in the end, we decided that we couldn't really release something that we wanted to call 1.0 without fixing some fundamental issues in dependency management. And having Ivy at the core and relying on Ivy to provide that functionality, we didn't really have a way to fix that. So we made the decision to start implementing our own engine and over time kind of moving Ivy out of the core. There are a few key things that we wanted to do before we got to 1.0 that we did. And that also allows us to continue to innovate and continue to deliver more features going forward. So this is an ongoing piece of work, but we really wanted to have a substantial amount done before we drew the draw line and said this is 1.0. Another key piece that we were working on was the Gradle build daemon. And you may or may not have used the Gradle build daemon. It's essentially a way to provide faster builds. It is a long-lived process that sits in the background, sort of a hot JVM, if you will, that has a warm caches and the just-in-time compiler uh, has sort of optimized and the hotspot optimizer has done some work as well. allows your, allows your builds to run faster. So it's, it's, it's really a transparent mode of operation. You can enable it a few ways. And that was a key... Uh, technology for us to have in place in a stable way for the release of 1.0. So we recommend on all developer workstations that that be enabled and developers use that. That's also an ongoing piece of work. We're continuing to improve the stability of the daemon and add more features, that kind of thing. But we really wanted to get it to a point where it was uh, usable every day, all day by the majority of users. We're also building the development team on the way to 1.0. So we were uh, bringing in engineers and kind of structuring the development team and structuring the development process as well. So we wanted to be in a position that when we released 1.0, we kind of had a, a full body of steam and we could just keep going with the same velocity forward. So that was a very important part as well. It, just, it wasn't just about building the technology, it was about building the team to then sustain the technology post 1.0. And also, of course, we had to do a, quite a bit of work to m map out where we were going after the 1.0 release is what we had been focused on for so long, but then we needed to work out where we were going to afterwards and be able to communicate that to our users. The Gradle 1.0 was released on the 12th of June this year. Um, not too early, I'd say. Uh, so Gradle 1.0, how do we think about this and how do we talk about it? We say it's a compelling evolution of existing build technology. So taking the existing tools that we had in the space, taking the best ideas from those tools, added some new ideas and, and uh, features and kind of made it a, a compelling choice if you're starting from scratch on a new project or looking to solve some of the problems that you have. So that's how we thought about 1.0. We wanted to be able to stand behind that statement for the 1.0 release. There's also a serious commitment to backwards compatibility so in the pre-1.0 pre releases, we were very careful about making backwards incompatible changes or breaking changes. 
but we still reserve the right to do that where we found it to be absolutely necessary and for the for the good of the product. With 1.0, we basically no longer uh, I'll do that. So there are no backwards incompatible changes unless in the very small uh, circumstances or the small chance that we find something that isn't really being used or it's potentially back, back um, a breaking change, but anything that is, is seriously used or it has the likelihood of, of impacting somebody if we make that change, we won't do it. So it's main, Gradle will maintain fully backwards compatible up to the Gradle 2.0 stage. And that's a very serious commitment. Uh, there's more information about that in the user guide for the 1.3 release. There's a new chapter called the feature life cycle that explains how we approach backwards compatibility and the terminology that we use in this space. And also I'd like to point out that this is something that we test for. It's part of our engineering process to ensure that new versions of Gradle are fully backwards compatible. Compatible, and that's something that we do test for in an automated way. We are also put an increased effort into the communication regarding releases with the 1.0 release, and we've continued that on. So we put much more effort into having detailed release notes and detailed documentation and associated bits and pieces that help people understand what's in a Gradle release, what might be in it that's useful to them, and why they might want to use it. So that's something we've put a lot of de a dedicated effort into as well. And our kind of stance, as well as being a comp compelling evolution of build technology, we like to think that uh, Gradle 1.0 and beyond is a good technology choice for many projects. It's moved beyond a kind of niche build tool. It's now applicable in many different scenarios. So that's a little bit about Gradle 1.0, but now we're here to talk about the things that have happened since 1.0. So just before, before I move on to the features, I just want to point out if you haven't um, read this in our announcements or the documentation that we put out, that we're on a six-week release cycle. So you can expect to see a new minor revision update to Gradle every six weeks. So sometimes it's, it's uh, that's a little bit flexible. Sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's eight, depending on what happens uh, regarding release candidates and a few other things. But generally, we aim for the six-week mark. There's a few reasons we do that. Uh, one, we're very keen to get new functionality into your hands as, as soon as we reasonably can. And we also want to get early feedback on the features that we're developing. So as we're adding new features, we're doing that in an iterative fashion so that we can get it in your hands, get the feedback, and then make the feature better before we lock it down and stabilize it. So it benefits everybody. It also means you get the latest and greatest Gradle features uh, in your hands sooner in a less aggressive cycle. That's also what we, could, what we would consider best practice in the field of software these days, releasing on a regular frequent schedule. Right, so enough of the um, theory and philosophy. Let's move on to some of the features. So the first one, this is actually one of my, my favorite features that has been added uh, since Greater 1.0, and it's probably one of the, probably is the smallest and the, the most, was the most simple for us to implement. It actually has quite a big impact. So you can now, do, when a task that produces a report fails, it will now print a full URL to the report right on the command line. And what that allows you to do is to actually click that URL and open it directly in your browser or whatever application reads that file. A lot of the time these tasks are producing HTML reports, so it's going to open the browser. But on, a, on a Linux machine, most of the terminal implementations or console implementations um, make links like hyperlinks. You can just click them and they'll open. On Mac OS, you hold down the command key or the Apple key and click it to open. And on Windows, you're a bit out of luck. There's no equivalent here. You still have to copy and paste it. So I'd just like to show this to you. Uh, all of the slides and demos that I'm going to be using today will be available online. And I'll show you at the end of the session, I'll show you where you can download that from right now. And also the recording of this session will be online before the end of the week as well. Right, so I have a very simple Java project here. I just have some Java source. I have a failing test. I'm applying the Java plugin, I'm also applying the find bugs plugin. So simple stuff. I run Gradle test. And I now see, so prior to 1.0, sorry, prior to 1.1, you would just see the path to the test report here. 
So to open that, you'd copy paste it or you do something along those lines to get it open. Now that it's a URL, if I hold down the command key and double click this, it opens directly in my browser, which is a huge time saver. When you don't have this feature, you'll really miss it. So it's also a universal feature. So that was for test reports where you might expect it. But now let's run find bugs. So find bugs is complaining about my code. Nothing new about that. So I now want to find bugs is producing a report as well. Uh, by default for find bugs, it's an XML report. So I've got XML report, XML files configured to open in my text editor. And that's why that's open on my system. So it's not just for HTML and it's not just for test reports. It's for any task that produces reports. So I want to change the find bugs configuration and say now instead of producing XML reports, I want to produce, sorry, instead of, yes, instead of producing XML, I want to produce HTML. So now I run find bugs again. Now it's giving me an error report, but in HTML format. So that's really nice. So on Mac OS, command, double click. On Linux, you just click on it. And on Windows, the resort to copy paste. Now just a reminder, feel free to ask any questions uh, at any time. I'll stop as, as I can to answer those. So that's a really cool feature. I, I, I quite like that one. It's very useful. All right, let's upgrade assistance. So I mentioned that we have a frequent release cycle. We want to try and build some tools into the system to help you keep current, to keep up to date with the latest Gradle releases. We understand that in some cases it's you can't, it's not a cost-free uh, proposition to upgrade your build tool. You know, it's if, if the build is broken because something, uh, a change in behavior from a release, while we work our hardest to um, prevent that from happening, you want to be sure it doesn't. But if there is a, a breaking change here and, and it puts out developers and people working on the project, they can no longer do their work. That's a serious issue. So I want to build in some tools to help you verify that it's safe to upgrade or if there is a change in behavior to explain what that is. So the upgrade assistance, uh, also called build comparison, kind of the, the same thing here, supports testing your build with different versions and also supports testing different builds. And this is probably best demonstrated by example. So I have another demo here. Right, so I have a simple Java project. And what I want to do is say, and this build at the moment is using Gradle 1.2. And I want to verify that it's the same when run with Gradle 1.3. So how I do that in a practical sense is I apply the compare Gradle builds plugin. That gives me a compare Gradle builds task where I can go and configure what needs to be compared. So let me just go ahead and run this. If I run Gradle compare Gradle builds. So what we're seeing here is the output of both builds being executed and they're being executed with the Gradle daemon. The other thing to notice that the similar to the way that Gradle wrapper works, Gradle will go and download any necessary versions of Gradle to run the comparison process. I already have Gradle 1.2 and Gradle 1.3 installed on my machine, so we didn't see it downloading. But if it didn't find Gradle 1.2 or 1.3, it would have gone and downloaded for me. I don't know. So that's happened. So it says build successful, which means that it hasn't found any difference between these two builds. So let me look up. If I go into build, reports, Compare Gradle builds, index.html. So this is the report that I get from the comparison process. So in a comparison, there are three different builds in play. There is the, the host build, which is the build that's actually running the comparison process. There is the source build, which is kind of like the baseline or what the current known good state. And the target build is what we're speculating about or wanting to you know, test against. So we get some information about the host build here. Uh, I'm running with Gradle version 1.3, but in this, so the host can be anything. It can be any version of Gradle, uh, but typically it would be the same as the source build generally. Uh, so here we have some information on the builds that are compared. So I get to see where 
does this project live on the file system? What versions of Gradle are they using? Now, the version of Gradle that I'm using between the two builds that I'm comparing is different. That's why it's highlighted in red. So any of these aspects that are different, excuse me, you'll see highlighted in red. And you talk about the compared build outcomes. So we're not really interesting, interested in comparing how the build works. We just want to verify that the build produces the same things. So if the two builds produce exactly the same jar at the other side, you can be quite confident that the, it's safe to upgrade and the build completes without error, of course. So I just want to show a different example. So that's the kind of upgrading case. I have the same build. I want to compare it with two different Gradle versions. So I have a little bit of a different setup here where I have three actual individual builds. So I have a host build, and I also have two different builds, build A and build B. And I'm setting up my comparison process to actually compare build A to build B. And just to, just to kind of show you what happens when there's a failure, but also to highlight that the comparison process is not restricted to just upgrading. That's just the most obvious case for it. So if I go into here, run Gradle, compare Gradle builds, it goes ahead and runs. So now it's telling me that the build outcomes were not found to be identical between these two builds. And here's the report. Now, in this case, the Gradle version was the same by both in both build invocations, but we were actually comparing different projects. So that's why we see this in red now. And these builds only had one outcome. They produced one jar. Now I can see that it's telling me that they were different. There are differences within the archive. The, um, the locations and everything were the same relative to the project, but these different entries within the jar file were different. So it doesn't just compare the jar file byte for byte and say they're different. It will actually look into the contents of the archive and see which of the entries are different, which is often much more interesting if you do actually have a difference here. So that's the, the kind of foundation of that. There's a chapter in the user guide talking about this uh, com this build comparison functionality. Um, so at the moment, it's it's just Gradle to Gradle build comparisons. We will be building this out to cover the case of comparing a Gradle build to an Ant build or a Gradle build to a Maven build for migration purposes. So you can basically migrate your build in a test-driven fashion. You're constantly comparing whether the outcomes of the builds are the same. So that's one uh, aspect we'll continue to work on. Another is expanding the kind of outcomes that we can compare. So at the moment, we're really comparing any zip-like uh, zip binary output, so uh, jar files, WAR files, zip files, that kind of thing. Uh, we'll also expand it to be able to compare test execution, that kind of thing, so you know that the build produces the same outcomes and it also runs the same sets of tests, which gives you even more um, of a impression of how safe it is to upgrade. So that was build comparison slash upgrade assistance. Another feature that we've added is the ability to convert a Maven build into a the equivalent Gradle structure. So it converts pom.xml files into build.gradle files, essentially. It's really designed to give you a starting point in the migration process. If you've got a complex project, it's unlikely that running this process will give you a complete Gradle build ready to go but it will do a lot of the mundane work for you in copying over the project structure, setting up project dependencies, copying dependency definitions, those kinds of things. So I'll have to give you a demonstration of this. No, one more directory. Just a reminder, feel free to ask questions at any time. All right, so I have a multi-module Maven build here. Relatively simple one. I have two jars being produced, an API jar and an implementation jar, and I also have a web, web application as well. So I can do things like MVN clean test package to go and build this Maven project. So that's built. At the end of it, I get my binaries and all the, the usual expected Maven stuff. So now I want to convert this over to the Gradle world. 
I can, in the root of the project, just put a build.gradle file, and I simply apply the Maven to Gradle plugin. Now, the Maven to Gradle plugin was something that started as a community contribution. Um, I can't recall the name of the person who developed it originally, but they wrote this functionality. It was out there for a while. A lot of people were using it to do some useful stuff. Uh, people asked if we could bring it into the core, and we looked at it and decided that was a good idea. So we've now made this part of the core Gradle distribution and done some work on it to improve it and a few things, and we'll also be continuing to improve it over the coming releases. So to use it, that's all I do. I create a build.gradle at the root of the Maven project, apply the Maven to Gradle plugin, then go to the command line and run Maven to Gradle. That process runs. So it's giving me some information here saying that the Maven to Gradle conversion is an incubating feature, so it's not stable in it. Um, it's useful and does a lot of good work, but we're still improving it. We still may make some changes, that kind of thing. And there's the pointer to the feature lifecycle documentation that I mentioned before. Anyway, let's have a look at what it gave us. So we get a settings.gradle file, which gives us the structure of the Gradle multi-project build. And we also have equivalent build.gradle files. So it's copied across, well, obviously it's going to, we're going to publish to a Maven repository having come from a Maven project. So we're applying the Maven plugin. It's copied the, the group identifier, the version, these kinds of things. It's copied things like the source compatibility. So it's picked up that the Maven project specified that it was Java 1.5 compatible, copied that across, and also identified that there were some common dependencies, either through POM inheritance or they were just duplicated through different projects, and lifted them up to the top level on the build.gradle and pushed them down by sub-projects. So it's reasonably smart, does some, does some cool things. Uh, it's copied across the repository definitions as well. Um, and it's done that for each of the projects. So, and for the war project, it's detected that it was a web application and, and applied the appropriate Gradle plugin. So you can see the formatting is not entirely correct, but it is functional and it's a good starting point to then go and do some work. So now we've got our Gradle build. Let's try and run it. And there we go. So same functionality, run a test, built our archives, doing exactly the same things that the Maven build does. Now, at this point, I always like to race the two. So, it's from MVN clean test package, which is roughly equivalent to a Gradle clean build. So, what do we get? 2.773 seconds. Gradle clean build, just under a second. So that's a, it's a nice little way to speed up your Maven builds. All right, so moving on, it's Maven conversion. So that, that's in there, that you can use that today. There's a chapter in the user guide giving you some information, but that's really all there is to it. You put that file in there, apply the plugin, run the task, away you go. So test output. Test output's another very cool feature. I improved the usability of running tests quite a bit. So you can now get detailed test information or information about your tests directly in the console. So previously, if you had a test failure, you would get notified that a test class failed and then you would have to go and look at the test report to get some further information about that. Unfortunately, failing tests are a factor of a developer's life, so we wanted to kind of uh, cut down the amount of work necessary to go and find what the failures were. So let me have a give you a demonstration of this. Maybe failing tests aren't a part of your life, but they sure are a part of mine. So I have a, a plain Groovy project here. Um, works for Java as well. Anything, it, it works with JUnit and TestNG, so it's um, it's not a Groovy specific feature. Um, I don't. So I have some configuration here. So one of the things about the test output is it's very configurable, but I've got everything configured. Uh, sorry, disabled. So we're just going to get the out of the box behavior. So let me run Gradle test. And I now get this improved output, giving me the name of the test class and the test method and the very top of the stack trace of what went wrong, which is usually good enough um, to give you some indication of what the error is. 
Uh, it's especially useful if your the error occurs right in your test script. Oh, sorry, test class. So that's the default behavior that you get out of the box. It's pretty useful. We can kind of take that further and say that we actually want to see the full exception, the full error exception. So now I get, this is the actual exception message. We're using Groovy here, and Groovy has this really cool feature of when an assertion fails, it gives you this nice diagnostic error message as the exception message. So that's what we're seeing here. Uh, whatever the failing exceptions message is, that's what you'll get here, and then the stack trace. And we've um, done a little bit of filtering here to cut out anything before your actual test code runs, because you don't necessarily want to see the stack frames of JUnit or TestNG or any of that stuff. So basically, from your code on is what you'll see with the default settings. But we're running Groovy here, and you can see that we're actually getting some internal Groovy showing up in our stack traces. And it's hopefully a bug isn't in the core of Groovy. So what we can do is actually say, well, just filter all those Groovy internals out of the stack trace. There's no point in seeing them. So now I run it and that gets cut out. So now I'm just left with my code. So that's very handy if you're uh, using Groovy. I can also disable stack traces. So if I like the message, if I like the exception message, but don't like the stack traces, I can leave exception format full on and just turn the stack traces off. So now I get the messages and no ugly stack traces. Um, a feature I really like is the ability to configure different logging levels to have different information. So if I just go and resort to the default configuration, but introduce this info block. So what we're saying here is that at the info log level, I want the full error exception. So I save that, mirror on Gradle test. Back to the default output, so rather terse output. Now if I run a Gradle dash I, I get the full exception message. So that's a great way to leave it terse by default, but when you need that extra information, enable it very quickly. And you can also log specific events as well. So if you're uh, doing some poor man's debugging and have a bunch of print lines in your test case and, and want to see them on the console, you can log the standard out and standard error events to see that output there. And you can also get the lifecycle events, these kinds of things. So let's see what that looks like. So now I see when the test is started, then it failed, another test started, and here are the standard out and standard error events. So anything coming from the test you can see directly on the console. And you can map each of these events to different logging levels and do all kinds of things on them. It's very, very configurable. So I have a question here. The question is, can I customize the test order dynamically? If a test fails, skip some other tests. You can't out of the box. Um, that's something that you'll really need your test execution engine to deal with. Because what happens, basically once test execution starts, we hand over to JUnit or TestNG, that kind of thing. So the functionality for that needs to be implemented at that level. I know JUnit doesn't have that functionality, but TestNG might. So it might be worth looking there. Um, but the, the simple answer to that question is no. There's no facility in Gradle to customize the test order dynamically. Unfortunately, it would be a great feature. So that was test outputs. Uh, the new dependency report. So Gradle, since forever, as far as I'm concerned, has had uh, a dependency report to give you the information on which dependencies you're using in your project. With the 1.2 release, we've improved this to uh, give some extra information to make things a little bit clearer. The key difference is that it now indicates both the requested and the selected versions of a dependency. So the requested version might be, uh, say, JUnit 4.8, and the selected version might be JUnit 4.10 because of conflict resolution or some any mechanism that forced um, 
ended up having another dependency on the dependency graph. So let's have a look at how that works. Close some many windows here. Right. So again, I have just a simple Java project, a few dependencies listed. I have a dependency range. So I'm saying I want the latest version in the 2.x line of Commons Lang. It's whatever that happens to resolve to. So the requested version is essentially the, the latest in 2.x. So we'll see how, how that, what that looks like. I also have a dependency on this Gradle jar here. It's not really important what it is, but the important characteristic is that it depends on this guy here, <clears throat> SLF4J API 166. But I also have an explicit dependency on SLF4J API 165. So we've now got a dependency conflict in play. And Gradle's default resolution strategy is to use the newest version that it finds on the dependency graph. So we can now visualize that pretty easily by running Gradle dependencies. So it's the same. So these are all the different conf dependency configurations in my project. They're all the same here, but let's just focus on compile. I see that for my version, my dynamic dependency, where I asked for 2.x, the latest, it resolved to 2.6. In earlier Gradle versions, all you would see is this guy. You wouldn't actually see that 2.6 is what ended up being used. You'd have to go to other lengths to actually then to see that information. It was available to you, just not in this report, not as conveniently. So that's a, that shows you the difference between a requested and selected. In this case, where you have a conflict, we can also see a similar kind of thing. So base services drags in SLF4J API 1.6.6. I requested 1.6.5 here on this dependency, but through conflict resolution ended up with 166. So that's what that notation is showing me there. So here's the requested, there's the selected. So on a large graph, you can then work out and pin back and exactly what's bringing in the versions that end up winning and end up in your graph. There's some uh, more information, but I'm going to show that via the, the next demo, which is the other new dependency report with a similar kind of format. So if you've ever tried to debug a dependency graph, that's pretty useful information. So if you know, on a large dependency graph, though, it, often you're asking questions about a particular dependency, trying to work out why a, either a particular version of that dependency is coming in or just where is that dependency coming from. In a large dependency graph, having a look at the tree as a whole, uh, it can often it can be difficult to see that with that much data. So we have a new um, report called Dependency Insight, which is kind of the inverse of the Dependencies Report, where the Dependencies Report showed the whole graph. The Dependency Insight Report focuses on one dependency and then sort of goes up the other direction towards the top of the graph. It essentially shows the path to a dependency can you be used to explain why you're getting a particular dependency in the graph. So let me go over to this guy. So I have a simple Java project again, and I have a JBoss dependency. Now, if you've ever worked on a project that has any JBoss dependencies, you'll know that you bring in one, you bring in a lot. So JBoss dependencies are notorious for having uh, lots of dependencies themselves. So in this case, I just have this one guy here. I run Gradle Dependencies, which is the traditional dependencies report. So just from that one dependency, I've got a reasonable size dependency graph coming in here. So I want to ask questions about a particular jar that I'm getting in my project that I'm having that is either surprising or I'm having some problems with or something like that. So the, the jar that I want to find out about is the Hibernate Validator jar. So I want to see why is that coming into my project? Where is that being dragged in from? So I could take this output and grep through it and have a look and find that guy. But with the new dependency report, this makes it becomes very easy. So I run Gradle Dependency Insight. I need to specify the particular configuration I'm interested in. 
and the dependency that I'm interested in. So when I run this, I get a similar kind of output, but instead of going from the top of the graph down, we now start at the dependency we're interested in and work back to the top of the graph. So this shows us all the ways that this dependency is coming into the tree. I don't necessarily want to do that. So Hibernate Validator is a dependency of JBoss as JPA, this guy. It's also a dependency of JBoss as EE, and JBoss as EE is being dragged in as a dependency of JBoss as JPA and JBoss as connector and all this other stuff. So you can see the reason for the entire path from this dependency right back up to the top of the graph being in existence. Very useful for working that kind of stuff out. So now I want to just introduce a dependency conflict. So we we're pulling in Hibernate Validator 4.2. Now I'm adding an explicit dependency on 4.0.0. So I would, I didn't, if I didn't realize that JBus's JPA was bringing in Hibernate Validator, I might be surprised to see that at the end of the day, 4.2 is coming into my project. And I want to know what is bringing in 4.2 when I asked for 4.0. So I ask the same question now, and I can see two top-level entries. I can see 4.2 appear, and I can also see 4.0, which is what we requested, and I can see that it was eventually selected to be 4.2.0, final. But I can also see that this the top-level entry that has this kind of yellow uh, text next to it is the, the winning version. And it gives me a reason here why this guy was selected. So 4.2.0 was the final selected version through conflict resolution. That's not always the case. So now I want to force 4.0.0 to be the guy that wins. If I run this again, I see that while this whole graph here was pulling in 4.2.0, actually 4.00 was selected. And the reason 4.00 was selected was that it was forced. So there's enough information here to actually get an accurate picture of what's going on and importantly why, because it's often the hard question to answer. So that's available in Gradle 1.3, which was released uh, earlier today. So the dependency resolution API, this is kind of the, the new functionality that underpins these new reports based around this resolution result class, and you can have a look at that guy in the API documentation. What it gives you is it gives you a model of the resolved dependency graph. It gives you access to the full graph and you can navigate it up and down. And it also importantly gives you information on what the requested version of a dependency was and what the selected version was. And that selection reason. So all that information we've been seeing in that depend these dependency reports We've been looking at you can get programmatic access to in quite an easy way and um, so we need to add this to enable ourselves to deliver these new reports but you can use this in kind of surprisingly useful ways so just to show what you can do with it I built an example of implementing a semantic version aware uh, conflict resolution checker I guess you could call it so for those who haven't heard of it semantic versioning is a kind of a versioning policy that has strict rules about which version numbers are compatible with other version numbers. And for, for our purpose here today, the important part is that major version number differences are incompatible. So if I have version 1.2 of a library and version 2.3 of a library, they're incompatible because they're different major versions. So what I want to do is say that if the selected version of a dependency has a different major version, to the requested version, then I want to fail the build, a fail conflict resolution, because that's an invalid situation. So to make that a little bit more concrete, in my project here, I'm depending, I have two dependencies. I'm depending on Groovy 1.8.6, and I'm also depending on a, a testing library called Spock. I'm just using it because it has Groovy as a transitive dependency. But its version of Groovy that it's bringing in is Groovy 2. So let's have a look. So I just comment all this stuff out to just to, it's not doing anything. So this is just kind of standard Gradle build. Let's have a look at the dependency tree. So we can look at this guy. We can see that Spock 
dragged in JUnit, but it also dragged in Groovy 2.0.5. I asked for Groovy 1.8, and I can see here in the output that I've actually ended up with 2.0.5. So if these libraries are semantically versioned, then this is now incompatible. My code that I've written to work with Groovy 1.8 isn't guaranteed to work with Groovy 2. So I kind of want to know about this. I don't want that upgrade to kind of silently um, jump that boundary between major versions. So I can use the new resolution API to kind of enforce a check to make sure this doesn't happen. So this code here is just for splitting up a semantic version number into the major minor patch parts. But the bit we're really interested in, in is this guy. So to all the dependency configurations, we get a hold of the incoming object. It just gives us some access to, to tweak some knobs regarding the, the resolution process itself. We can get access to the resolution result object and attach some callbacks to it. Do a few different things, but in this case, we're using the sort of the callback style. And we're saying that as each dependency is resolved as part of the resolution process, fire this bit of callback code against it. So then we're going to, this, so we're running this, we're resolving dependencies, a dependency comes down, this code runs. First thing we're doing is checking that both the requested version and the selected version are semantic capable numbers. If they're not, then we don't understand them, we can't, this check doesn't make any sense. So if we understand them, then we keep going, basically break them out into their different parts. Then we say that if the requested major version is different to the selected major version, then we have to stop the process and say that's a conflict that we can't deal with. So now I've got this in play. If I run Gradle jar, if I save the file, that might help. Run Gradle jar, I now get some information saying that failure dependency Groovy 1.8.6 was requested, but 2.51 was selected, and this is a different selected major version than what was requested. So just an example there of how you can use this new hook to kind of implement some um, some nice stuff. So I need to stop for a question here. So the question is, is there a plan to incorporate that functionality into Gradle via simple config? So I'm assuming that you mean basically a, a switch to turn on to give you semantic aware uh, conflict resolution. And yeah, the answer is yes, there will be at some point a way to enable this uh, just out of the box. That's definitely that's something we're working on. Uh, but if you want to use it in the meantime, you can get grab this code from the, the link I'll be showing at the end. Cool. Right, so moving along. That was the dependency resolution API. We've also been doing a lot of work uh, to improve the performance and memory consumption, to decrease the memory consumption of Gradle. So release on release, we test and measure the performance in different profiles and the memory consumption in different situations. We always ensure that each release is faster and uses less memory than the previous release. So since 1.0, this is something that we've been testing for. We've set up dedicated testing infrastructure to make sure that Gradle is getting faster and not slower. Uh, we've made some 1.2, we kind of had the biggest gain. We made some optimizations to the dependency resolution process and for most projects, saw a reduction in heap consumption by about 30%. Uh, in larger projects, it was even greater than that, but that was quite a, a nice saving. And we're continuing to find uh, different bottlenecks and, and make things faster as we go forward. So it's always some, there's something we're constantly chipping away at is making Gradle faster as a whole. So part of that is actually enabling parallel execution as well. So this is something that was delivered in Gradle 1.1. It's an incubating feature, so it's still under development, and there are some cases where it doesn't quite work as well as we might like, we're continuing to work on. Let's have a look at that. So I have a multi-project build. Now, the first thing to say about parallel execution is that it's parallel on the project level. If you have a single project build, running it with the parallel switch on won't give you any advantage because the individual tasks within a project are always executed serially, but across project boundaries, we can work out which bits can be done in parallel. So you'll only see this uh, having any advantage on a multi-project build. So a simple uh, kind of project setup here. 
I have a shared jar, an API jar, and a web service jar, essentially. So this guy, this guy, and this guy. Uh, API depends on shared. Web service depends on API and shared, that kind of thing. Details aren't too important, but it's kind of typical multi-project structure. So if I run this guy with Gradle build, so it builds OK, runs the test, takes me about 3.144 seconds. If I run, let me clean it. If I run with dash dash parallel, it's actually gone and split all that work up into parallel streams and executed them concurrently. And it's by specifying just dash dash parallel, it will take a guess at how many parallel threads to spin up to execute this based on the number of cores on your machine, the number of projects, that kind of thing. So if you have many, many projects, it's going to spin up as many parallel threads as you have cores on your machine minus one. So that's all you need to do to enable parallel building. If you're going to use this, I definitely recommend having a look in the user guide at the section on this. There are some restrictions in the way you structure your builds to be able to use this. So that chapter makes it very clear on what you need to do. It talks about decoupled projects and that kind of thing. So just dash dash parallel runs in parallel, guessing the number of threads. I can be a bit more explicit about it. Threads, yeah. Threads, not thread. I can say, I'm run it in 10. It's a bit silly. So that's as, that's as easy as it is to run in, um, in parallel. And that's something we're continuing to work on that and make it more robust, that kind of thing. Uh, in the performance space, we've also invested a lot of work in making in increasing compile performance. And one of the ways we've done this is to, similarly to how we reuse JVM processes to speed up builds in general, we have dedicated JVM processes to deal with compilation, to enable Hotspot to you know, optimize the code path and that kind of thing. So we've implemented this now for Java, Groovy, and Scala. Um, I'd check out the chapters on those plugins on how you enable this. It is enabled for Groovy by default. Uh, for Java and Scala, it is not. Um, you'll have to have a look at the documentation and give you that, some details on that. Basically, at the end of the day, what you get are faster compile times by the use of these compiler demons. We've also done quite a lot of work, specifically in the 1.3 release, on improving our Scala support. So we now have full support for the Scala incremental compiler. And we've been working with the TypeSafe guys on this. So they developed a, a very smart compiler that can uh, compile Scala and J mixed Java code incrementally. And that was originally uh, a feature in SBT, the Scala build tool. Uh, and we've worked with them to integrate it into Gradle. So you can now significantly reduce your Scala compile times. Native integration, just a, a, a quick word on this that we've started to um, look into ways to leverage the native platform that we're running on, kind of going beyond what the, the Java APIs can give us. And we're finding more and more that as we look into the space and try and leverage native libraries, it's going to allow us to do more interesting things. So we have a much tighter integration with the terminal. For example, we can detect uh, line wrapping or, or terminal resizing, that kind of thing. It becomes much easier to deal with the file system and deal with permissions kind of things if you're working at the native level. So we're really, this is something that we're sort of taking very seriously and building into our process, the ability to create native components on um, each platform that we're working on. So this will be mostly a background thing, but you'll just see some uh, cool, new, exciting features as a result of us uh, embracing native integration more. Uh, continue on failure is kind of a cool feature. So sticking with the, the multi-project build that we were just using, when you're in a sort of CI context, so let me just backtrack a little. Gradle's default behavior is to stop on the first failure that it encounters. So we, as soon as there is a task failure, Gradle will stop and not do any more work. That's not always what you want to happen. Sometimes you want to just continue and have Gradle do as much as it can so you can get as much feedback as possible. So I'm just going to introduce a test failure here, just changing one of the assertions to fail. If I run Gradle clean build, 
I get a test failure in the shared component. So there was still more work to be done. I didn't actually run the tests for the web service component because we had a failure, we stopped. But what I can do is I can run Gradle in build dash dash continue, which tells Gradle to, even though something failed, keep going and do as much as you possibly can. So because the building and the testing of the web service component isn't affected by the testing of the shared component, it's not dependent on that. It can continue to happen. So when there is a uh, failure, task failure, any task that depended on that task that failed can't be run. That's not safe to do that. But tasks that weren't dependent on it are still safe to continue. So it's a, it's a good option to enable on your CI server to get as much value as possible out of your CI runs. Uh, the Android support. So if you, if you haven't uh, seen the news, the Google team have decided to embrace Gradle as the build tool for the Android development system. So the, the next version that is using the Gradle plugin is currently in beta, will be finalized soon. But they've moved from Ants over to Gradle to uh, build their Android tool. So this is the official supported development kit from Google is now using Android. And you simply apply an Android plugin, it gives you a custom DSL to talk about the, the certain specific things about building Android products in there and as you go. So that, that's really exciting for us. We're really happy to see Google getting some good use out of Gradle. So that was the, the overview of some of the cool features that have been added in the releases since 1.0. There are a few other ones. I just kind of want to pick out the highlights. Let's just quickly talk about some things going forward and be wrapping up shortly. So dependency management. Dependency management is an ongoing issue for us. We're continuing to make performance improvements here, um, add greater control, greater precision, those kinds of things. And also looking towards a kind of new and expanded model, looking to sort of go places that the existing formats that we have, such as the POM and IVXML, don't really um, take us today. So dealing with things like variants. So having in the native world, this is a very common problem, dealing with a, a binary that's produced for different architectures or 32-bit versus 64-bit, debug versus non-debug, these kind of things. Uh, in the Java space, we kind of have this problem so I think uh, JDK 1.4 compatibility versus JDK 1.5 or 6.7, that kind of thing. So it's the same problem. We just have it to a lesser extent in the Java space. Because so we're trying to build that into the dependency model and make that a really um, easy concept to deal with. It's a little bit painful right now dealing with things like Maven classifiers and that kind of thing. Our publication types, so going beyond publishing just a single JAR file and, that, and talking about that as the publishable unit. We're going to be able to talk about things like libraries. And the library has an API and an implementation. And why that kind of thing is important is that we can then use that in a context-sensitive manner. So if I depend on a library and I'm compiling against that, I can just pull in what's necessary to compile against this API. But if I'm running, then I know I need its actual implementation as well. So I want to talk about that as one thing, but depending on how I'm using it, get kind of different uh, parts of it. I guess. So we talk about that as publication types or components. So having these, these richer concepts in the dependency management space is something we're actively working on. Uh, implicit plugins. This is just kind of a usability convenience feature that we're working on so that you can specify tasks to run from the command line and we can infer what, what plugins we need to apply to satisfy that request. So if you think of the case of uh, upgrade assistance or comparing Gradle builds, what you really want to be able to do is just to go to your project, not have to touch the build script at all and run Gradle compare, Gradle upgrade or something like that and have it all just kind of work for you. So based on the fact that you specify that task, we can apply the compare Gradle builds plugin, pre-configure everything ready to go. So that's one use case. Another use case is being able to integrate with IDEs. So let's say you check out a pro, uh, open source project on GitHub or something like that. The author was using Eclipse, but you want to open the project in IDEA. You don't really want to have to go into the build script and add the IDEA plugin, that kind of thing. So with this feature, you'll be able to just say Gradle IDEA, and we can implicitly apply the plugin and have the functionality happen for you, kind of thing. So just improve the usability a little bit. And then coming releases will also be improving on our JavaScript support. So there is some um, JavaScript tooling sitting in the Gradle code base right now. It's still incubating not quite public, um, we haven't, there's not really any documentation for it right now, but over the coming releases we'll be building that out and making that a uh, JavaScript a first-class citizen 
in the greater world. So um, if you're if you're inter more interested in that space, um, maybe ask some questions via the Gradle forums, and we can help you out with that stuff. But um, our, our vision is to make J Gradle a compelling tool for doing JavaScript-based automation and JavaScript-based tooling. C and C++, we'll be continuing to work in this space to improve Gradle's ability to build native components. Um, we need this internally to build our, our components to enable our native platform support, but it's also a very, very um, interesting area for many large enterprises dealing with C++ code bases, sometimes mixed with Java, sometimes not. Uh, Gradle can really bring a lot to that build process. So we're continuing to build that out. Plugin developers will also be putting some effort in to make the lives of plugin developers a little bit easier. Both plugin developers who are developing internal plugins for the enterprise or developing plugins to share with the community. So doing things like making it very easy to test your plugins, making it easy to produce documentation for your plugins, probably in a similar way to the Gradle documentation itself. Uh, make it easy to share plugins. So uh, having a, a kind of repository, that kind of thing, a registry of different plugins that are available. Also making it easier to consume plugins as well. So um, this is something that we're actively working on and want to make uh, everybody's life easier in this space. Scalability. Scalability is a big issue for us in that we want to see Gradle working in cases where there are you know, hundreds or not thousands, if not thousands, of projects in a multi-project build and have Gradle be very fast and efficient in that environment in terms of consumption and resource consumption in general. So Gradle is already a, a scalable tool, but there are cases out there where there are very, very large projects. We want Gradle to do well in those situations. So we're continuing to make um, architectural changes and provide new modes of operation that are kind of geared towards these very, very large projects. So that uh, neatly brings us to the end. Of course, if you're interested in more uh, Gradle-related material, training services, that kind of thing, go to gradleware.com. There's a whole bunch of information on there about our service products. Uh, some links there to some more Gradle resources. So thanks for thanks for attending the Gradle Innovation Continues. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send them through.